pair programming isn't simply working together on a problem, there's a very strict way of going about it. In addition, pair programming can feel very scary. If you're new to it, then being vulnerable doesn't exactly come easy to most people. It can also be draining in terms of energy and difficult to sustain. So why do I recommend pair programming? Let's talk about it. Part 1. So why pair programming? In short, it increases code quality, it levels you up as a programmer, it ensures shared code on the long run, and it removes the need for things like a knowledge transfer and code reviews. Let's look at them all. Pair programming makes you explain your thinking while you're working together, you're solving the problems, you're decomposing the problem, you split it up in a certain way into this separation of concerns, you came up with these interfaces, these names of functions and classes and modules, and you picked this type of coupling. That's the important stuff on the long run. That's what matters for code quality. You keep discussing the big ideas, and that's why it increases code quality. It levels you up as a programmer because you get to solve problems together and people are different. They have different approaches to problems, different point of views. This advantage is multiplied if you have a very diverse team because the more different your background, the more creative and different the solutions will be. And if you get insights and you get to intervene in somebody's thought process, then you will learn this approach. You will get this point of view and you can apply it in the future for your own solutions as well. Pair programming can also level you up if you use it to learn a new skill, like a language or a framework. The moment you pair an expert and a beginner on a certain topic together, then the beginner effectively has a full-time mentor on that topic. Learning will go a lot faster this way. Pair programming can also be used to learn a new part of the code base, something you're not familiar with yet. I've talked about the idea of shared code versus code ownership before. Code ownership is having a single person responsible for one file, module, class, or a few of those, but one part of the code base is just the responsibility of one person. That person is the only one who can make changes to that code base. Code ownership is a bad idea. The opposite is shared code, where the entire team, the entire group of people own everything together. Shared code is the way. Shared code is the best practice. Pair programming is a way into more shared code ownership. Not immediately, but over time, if you do a lot of pair programming, shared code ownership will emerge. If you want to learn more about this, check out my video on code ownership. And then a note about code reviews. Pair programming is sort of a live code review. While you are typing, there's somebody looking over your shoulder and already doing the code review. So doing a code review after you've done pairing doesn't make sense. You don't have to do a code review in that sense. When you're not pairing, you should do a code review. But you have to realize that a code review is not a replacement of pair programming. You should always prefer pair programming over a code review. Part two, how? Pair programming is two people writing code together on one machine. The idea itself is not complex, but the execution definitely takes practice and some rules. There's a few different styles out there and I recommend two, the most common ones. The first style is driver navigator. The driver is the one sitting behind the keyboard and the mouse and the navigator is the one sitting next or behind that person. The driver is the only one allowed to touch the keyboard and the mouse. The navigator is not allowed to touch the keyboard and the mouse. The driver is the one who focuses on the details and the one who does the implementation. The navigator is the one that focuses on the big picture, the big ideas of the code. And they ask questions. Once they see a mistake, they wait a bit to see if the driver spots it and then they ask a question to direct the way the driver is going. The navigator is doing a live code review. The navigator must not micromanage. That is one of the things that make pair programming very annoying for the driver very quickly. So don't spell out as a navigator which shortcuts to press, how to name the function exactly. Yes, if there's some discussion in between about hmm, what should I name this and the driver is asking for help, you should help them, of course. But you don't want to spell out in too much detail what's going on. There's some high level guidance going on from the driver, uh, from the navigator to the driver. To keep it sustainable, it's important that you switch roles every 10 minutes or so. You, you need to agree on this beforehand. It's also important that you take enough breaks Every 30 minutes, you take a 10 minute break. That may seem like a lot, but pair programming takes more energy. It can be draining if you don't take enough breaks and it also yields higher quality code. So you should feel okay with 
taking more breaks. The second style is pair code reviewing. When you have code that was written by an individual not in a pairing style, it makes sense to do a code review. So you could do that code review with two people. You could still apply the ideas of drive, driver, navigator, and therefore start practicing the skills. It's an easy way to start pairing if you don't have experience with pair programming yet. It requires thinking out loud, especially if you're the person, the driver that is with the keyboard and the mouse, you need to think out loud what you're reading, what you're thinking, what you're, uh, what problems, potential problems you see, how you're understanding the code, what the bigger ideas of the code are. And the navigator is then reviewing those thoughts again and also being there to build up knowledge about that part of the code. When pairing a code review, you need to align on a structured way of going through the code. And I don't mean read it like a book, line by line. I mean, follow the data first for example, or which I've talked about before, Maslow's pyramid of code, where you have these layers of correct, secure, readable. I think if you go in through this pyramid, bottom to top, you really are tackling the important bigger issues first. You focus on the quality and the less important issues, you're not wasting time on, you're not bike shedding. One thing you need to decide as a team is when you want to rotate pairs. And when I say rotate pairs, I don't mean the roles driver navigator, I mean which two people are working together. Your team is usually bigger than two people, so which two people are working together at what time, on what stories? Are they working together on a story and when that story is done, they split up again and start pairing with other things or do individual work? Or are they paired together for a fixed time, like two or three days? And this is actually the most common way of doing things, but you need to decide as a team, there's no silver bullet here. If you want to start, start slowly, start with pair code reviewing, then maybe do one or two issues together and then go to a situation where you have a fixed pair for a few days. But that is the more advanced way of doing it. You have to keep in mind that if you start pairing the length of a feature or user story, then all features are different lengths. So you will have a non-paired work in between. This can be an advantage or a disadvantage. If you want to go all in to pair programming, then this is probably not the way. And you should have fixed times when you swap the pairs. And there's again best practices around swapping when you have fixed times. You should probably have a one person who stays on that feature instead of rotating everything, then you're losing again the knowledge. Another thing to consider is how you do remote pairing. At the very least, you need video conferencing software with a share screen feature. I think almost all have them, but how far do you want to go? Do you want this one person's machine that the code is being written on? If you rotate pairs, suddenly the other person should be able to control the remote desktop. Not all video conferencing software has that. You could also do pair programming together with test-driven development and trunk-based development, which it was designed for. The moment you commit a lot, then it's easy for the other person to check out the code when they switch roles and you only need video conferencing software. But if you don't have that, you will need software that has a remote control desktop. There's also tools like VS Code with the live share extension. Whatever you use, make sure you still have video on and you have a headset for good audio quality. You make it comfortable with yourself. You remove distractions like turn off your phone. You really focus, that's, that's important. When you're just starting out, I don't think you should suddenly pair everything. I, I think you should start slowly. So what kind of work is most important to start pairing on in the beginning? And I've talked about this before in my video on code ownership, skill mapping and pair programming to solve that problem. The moment you have topics in your code that are just owned with one person, or there are a few people who don't know this specific part of the code base because it's a framework or language they don't know yet. Those are the topics you want to pair on in the beginning. And when you get more experienced as a team, you can, you can take this further. You can say, we pair everything from now. We have a work in progress limit, say you do Scrum. We have a work in progress limit of the number of people divided by two. Everything is paired from now on. And we pair five or maybe six hours per day. When you start pairing more often, you'll realize that it can cost a lot of energy. Maintaining focus for so long can be very draining. So five or six hours is considered a lot. You should not try to pair eight hours a day. That's not sustainable. That's gonna burn you out. I've given a few recommendations on how to start pair programming, but in the end, there's no silver bullets. You need to figure out as a team how you want to do this. The recommendations I've given, maybe they're not valid or they're only somewhat valid for your team. There's many different ways to do this right. I can't prescribe an exact way of working that's valid for everybody. Extreme programming and agile are about responding to change, adapting. 
This is why Scrum has a retrospective, to continuously, every sprint, change the process so that you optimize it for less frustration, more quality, more velocity. So keep changing your process. Consider this only a starting point. To summarize, pair programming has a lot of benefits and it's easy to get started with if you take it slow, if you go step by step. To learn more, I recommend to read the pair programming article on the website of Martin Fowler by Birgitta Buckler and Nina Siesiger. I'm probably pronouncing this wrong. It, it goes a lot deeper. It builds on what this video is about and it discusses all kinds of details that uh, and challenges that you, you might run into. I'll admit it's a long article, but it's a very good place to learn even more. It has loads of useful insights. And that's it. I hope you liked it. I hope this was useful. I'd like to hear your thoughts in the comments. Did you try pair programming? Did it help you? Are you successful as a team? Are you not using it? Do you hate it? Did you run into all kinds of problems that were not solvable? Are you running into a manager that's forbidding you to pair program? What's, what's the story you're dealing with? Please let me know in the comments and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching.